Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. Listeners, I am very excited for our interview this week, and we will be introducing our guests in one moment, but did want to give a shout out to our presenting chess education sponsors, Chessable.com. They've got some great looking new courses, including Tactical Vision for Beginners by Grandmaster Sam Shanklin. Shanklin, of course, is very well reviewed both as a book author and a Chessable author, in addition to being an amazing player. So it's exciting that he is doing something a little bit geared more towards beginners than his other works. There's there's also tons of new opening courses, including one on the Alep and Sicilian, one on the Classical Sicilian by renowned trainer, Grandmaster uh, Srinath. And there's just so many more. So be sure to always take a look at what Chessable has to offer. And if you sign up for Chessable Pro using the link in the show description, it will help to support Perpetual Chess. And you will also get discounts on courses and other types of goodies. As for our guest this week, I've been preparing for this one for a while. He's in, in, written some incredible books. Uh, he is also a two-time Dutch champion, a many-time Olympian. I think it's 11. Uh, he's He turned into, in later years, a meditation teacher. Uh, for many years, he was a renowned opening theoretician who edited the New in Chess yearbooks and also wrote the fantastic and popular opening encyclopedia, Fundamental Chess Openings. The occasion of this particular interview is two books that are now widely available or will be shortly by the time this comes out. Uh, number one is a chess memoir slash game collection called In Black and White. It was originally published in Dutch in 2011, but was recently translated to English by New in Chess. Like I said, soon it will be available everywhere. You can already get it on Forward Chess. It's a detailed and honest chess memoir. It gives a blow-by-blow blow of his career from beginnings all the way through. Plenty of both chess and life details. And in the forthcoming issue of New in Chess, uh, in his book review section, Grandmaster Matthew Sadler wrote, quote, I think it's simply the finest chess book I've ever read. I read it too, and I also thought it was absolutely fantastic. So I'm excited to discuss that one. But he also has a brand new book called Mindful Chess. Uh, after Paul retired from professional chess, he got heavily into meditation, going on many retreats, and even became a meditation teacher. And this book is a concise look back at what he learned from chess, from meditating, and how he thinks the two relates. So we've got plenty to discuss, and I am honored to welcome to the program Grandmaster Paul von der Steren. Welcome, Paul. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Yeah, excited to chat. Oh, and I forgot one more detail. You are the chairman of the Max Owe Center, which we will also be discussing there in historic Amsterdam. But Paul, there's so much to dig into. I've been, I've really, re I've read and greatly enjoyed both of your books. And obviously, uh, they're different books, uh, one being sort of like a meditation, a sort of big picture look at both chess and mindfulness and how they relate. But then in black and white, this broad sweep look at your career that traces both its peaks and valleys and a sort of slow decision that chess was not captivating you as much as you as it used to, as I said, greatly enjoyed it. But I thought we might start with what most consider to be the highlight of your career. Uh, at age 37, 1993, you had this incredible year. You won the Dutch championship for the second time um, in, you know, smashing fashion, basically, uh, one clear of the field and qualified for the candidates for the only time you would in your career. And a lot of people listening, most of us are amateur chess players, but we're hoping to have breakthroughs true and too. And obviously you write about this at length in your book, but sitting here right now, you know, more than 10 years after you wrote that book, what do you think happened in 1993? <laughs> Well, this is perhaps one thing I discovered when I wrote the book, uh, that uh, these things are really inexplainable. Uh, I don't know what happens. It's a real mystery uh, to me uh, as well. Um, of course, it's very attractive uh, to tell yourself, uh, well, of course I had this fantastic result because I'm a great player. So naturally I, I should have a success like this at least once in my life. Uh, but that's just fooling yourself. Um, I really don't know what happened. Uh, probably it had something to do with a very bad year I had before that. In 1992, I had quite a few disasters, uh, real disasters, I mean, result-wise in, in my tournaments. Uh, but um, what I 
found, what I think I found uh, during the period I wrote this book, is that it's a natural up and down movement. And so you somehow, your mind, or my mind, but I'm pretty sure this is goes for everybody, it just goes up and then goes down again. And after the very bad results I had in 1992, uh, I was simply due for a great up. And uh, of course, that it would be such a wonderful up and over a very long period of time, I couldn't foresee that at all. But um, that's, let's say, if, if we're looking for rational explanations, then uh, I should say it's the natural movement of the mind to go up and then go down again, then go up, then go down again. This is what I found over my complete career uh, from about 1970 to 2000. And you wrote in your book that you, even at that time, you sort of felt like this may be the peak. Um, what do you think gave you that perspective? Whereas I feel like a lot of people, even after all those ups and downs, as you describe, a lot of people might think, oh, I've broken through to a new level. But, mm -hmm. but you, it seemed like you were a, a little more, um, a little more modest at that point. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's a question of being modest. Um, I did feel that I had broken through to a level uh, where I hadn't been before. Um, I never went back, I think, to being the Paul van der Stern uh, before 1993. But uh, I think I also knew what was coming, uh, which was uh, a dip down again. So I was, of course, a bit disappointed when things started to go downhill. But by then I had, uh, I was fully convinced that it, this was the natural uh, course of events and that uh, this uh, up and down flow was uh, also what I had to thank for, uh, that uh, I went up so high in 1993. But each time I was on a high like that, uh, I never came back to the old level, it was always a gradual movement up until, of course, it became a gradual movement down, which happened a few years after that. Hmm. Yeah. Right. And you wrote in the book that you were you didn't even want to mention this at the time because you felt like maybe it's not perceived as something real, but you felt like buying a new house and moving may have contributed to, to your success in that year. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I mentioned in the book that this is something I never discussed with uh, other chess players because they just wouldn't believe me or they wouldn't want to hear this. But external um, circumstances uh, have a very great influence on your performance as a chess player. And I think uh, what helped me enormously was that I moved house in 1993. Uh, which uh, by force cleared my mind uh, from everything else for a period of several weeks. And I think this did me uh, a lot of good. So this helped me. This was between uh, the Dutch Championship and the Interzonal Tournament in Biel, where I qualified for the candidates. Um, so it, it wasn't. Uh, it was in between two very good tournaments, but it did certainly help me to uh, to, to to take my mind off chess to in in a way to relax. Although moving house isn't in itself a relaxing event, but it relaxed my mind from chess completely. So I, yes, I'm pretty sure that this uh, maybe was the decisive factor. In fact, but this is of course something you can't plan. This is this is something you only uh, reflect on afterwards. You you can't say, okay, I'm going to to play a great Tata Steel tournament, so I'm going to move house first in December. That that's not the way it works. Yeah, although there is something. Uh, picking up on your work on mindfulness, there's something mm -hmm. about sort of like the act of letting go, you know, yeah. the the yeah. act of not yeah. caring as much because you're distracted may yeah. may lead to um yeah. to a higher high. And yeah. 
Of course, in the candidates match, you played a young star, Gada Kamsky. Yeah. Uh, you lost that match. Uh, mm -hmm. The score indicates it's not that, that close. But when you go through the games and relive the emotions with you in the book, mm -hmm. it, it was was close. Yeah, um, was. What are your memories looking back at that match? Well, first, I immediately knew that I didn't have that level anymore of the summer uh, of 1993. Um, but still, I think I had a very decent level and I was playing pretty good. Uh, something, it must have been something mental. I lost the match because there were two games where i was winning one i was just completely winning and the other I was also fairly winning uh two games which i lost both by uh huge one move blunders and uh i think it was that weakness which had come back i mean i, I throughout my career i've always been prone to making blunders uh in the summer of in 1993 this was completely absent Never happened. Uh, but when I played Kamsky in uh, January 1994, uh, this uh, weakness had re-established itself in my mind. And uh, that's what um, what caused me to lose the match. I think I played pretty well, apart from the fact that uh, I made two really bad blunders. And you can't do that, of course. Uh, giving um, two points away in a short match like that is uh, just uh, too much. Yeah. And if memory serves, you blundered away the first game, but then you came back and won yeah. and then yeah. basically repeated the cycle. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's that's t And then I lost. Well, the it's good that you well. did those things. Sorry. Yeah. 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 And then it was over. Um, but you make it more you make yeah. it more relatable for us amateur players by doing that. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, basically, I I mean, mind of a top player works exactly the same way as uh, an amateur player. Um, and I th that's why I think this is a universal process that you have ups and then necessarily you have a down again and then up and then down again. Um, Maybe what uh, distinguished well me from many amateur players is that um, I could live with that. You know, I didn't give up. It's so easy, and I see uh, I've always seen a lot of very talented young players uh, simply give up on chess because they can't deal with the disappointments. And there will always be disappointments, and that's unavoidable. I mean, even Magnus Carlsen has had to work his way through many disappointments. And uh, what distinguishes, I think, uh, top players from um, lesser players is that they, they simply don't care. They take these disappointments and they carry on. And you feel like that was generally a strength of yours? I think so. Yes, I think so. I've had so many disappointments. Uh, uh, if I uh, wouldn't have been able to deal with them, um, I, I, I'd have given up on chess uh, when I was about 25 or something. Then w when, I, when I still could have chosen another career in my life. And that's what, that's what many very right. talented young players do. They, uh, they are very good as juniors. They're very good in their... 20s and then they when they still when they're still young enough to choose a different career they quit chess and do something more uh, stable mentally stable yeah and you and you write about that that push and pull a lot obviously yeah. ultimately finally retiring at 45 and becoming a meditation teacher were the, were there any periods in your earlier years where you were close to pursuing a different career well <clears throat> i think i was but um at the age of about 22 23 i think i was fairly set on my chess career maybe a little bit later 25 but um okay. when you're young i think they're naturally there are moments of doubt i mean there's always pressure from other people my parents for instance i mean 
they were they were pretty uh, relaxed about my choosing a professional chess career, but still, uh, they were probably hoping for some years that I would uh, become a decent lawyer or something. Um, so yes, especially when I was young, there there were some moments. But uh, well, at at some point you just choose, and then you don't look back. Yeah, although you do look back. Luckily for us, yeah, <laughs> yeah. we got to read this book. <laughs> well, um, that, and it's very interesting. Returning that, to sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was uh, go ahead and start. I, no, I go ahead. Say that uh, when I stopped playing tournaments, when I stopped playing chess professionally, um, it's sort of suddenly happened to me that I started to enjoy writing books. So I wrote uh, the Dutch version of um, uh, Fundamental Chess Openings. And then I simply, to my own surprise, discovered that this, in a way, replaced playing chess. Uh, not in all ways, of course, but uh, in that I took a lot of pleasure from writing. And then I naturally continued to write. Uh, after that, I... Um, wrote the English uh, version, which became Fundamental Chess uh, uh, Openings. Um, after that, I started on this uh, autobiography, uh, Zwart op Wit in Dutch, which is now in black and white. And uh, it, it, it was just very, very uh, surprising and satisfying to discover that a lot of the pleasure I playing chess had given me uh, was now available to me uh, through writing. So in a, in a very different way, it uh, gives me much pleasure to, to do this creative thing, which is called writing. Yeah, and uh, again, an incredible works, and I, I, I want to discuss all of them. Now, on the topic of in black and white, one of the many things that struck me was your absolutely incredible recall of events and tournaments going all the way back to your childhood. So I was curious, Paul, if uh, did you take notes? Were you keeping a diary like or was you were able to remember everything as you went through the games? Yeah, yeah this helped me enormously. Uh, I have uh, kept diaries for large periods of my life, uh, not always, but very uh, long periods. Uh, I have um, always collected uh, paper clippings uh, of, you know, I'm not quite sure if this is, uh, it's been probably not the same in America, but in Holland, uh, chess was really very, very popular. It still is, but it was it was widely written about in the newspapers uh, during the seventies, eighties, nineties, my time. So um, I have a lot of paper of, of clippings uh, of my own tournaments, which helps my memory enormously. And then, of course, I also made notes. I always uh, made notes of my games, and sometimes I wrote little texts uh, about uh, how I experienced uh, certain tournaments. So yes, I had a lot of uh, notes to base my uh, book upon, and uh, this helped my memory enormously. I think without those, it, it would have been a more, much uh, flatter book. Yeah, it's good. good lesson for everyone listening and for myself, that the, the value of, of keeping notes and diarying, you, you never know when you might want to, to return to those things. And we should say for listeners, one thing I appreciated is that uh, New and Chess, uh, you and the team made a decision not to just inject all of your analysis with engine lines here in, well, probably done in 2023, but here we are in 2024, but just preserved your thoughts as they were shared in sort of a classical way. Um, th that made it much more enjoyable to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's, I'm, I'm glad you you take that point of view. I, I, I really appreciate that. Well, the whole idea of the book is to uh, express how I reflected on my chess career. And uh, I thought it's um, just much more in line with that uh, philosophy to 
not make new analysis with engines and to just um, restrict myself to what I thought about my games in 1970, in 1980, in 1990. Uh, the thoughts about my games when I played them, I, I didn't think uh, it was an addition to to those memories to uh, reflect on them with with engines anybody can use the engines for themselves if they if they look at my games uh, so um yeah this is uh, not something that uh, the book uh, provides and i think um it it would make it a, di a very different book if i had used engines yeah well said um and returning to the topic of memory, so you mentioned you were helped a lot by all the notes and journaling yeah. that you did. I'm just curious because we've been talking recently on the pod. I've interviewed a couple cognitive scientists and been talking about, you know, how adults can um, help their own memories. So I'm curious if your notes were something and reviewing your games was something that you did periodically over the years, or was it more like you set it aside and didn't look at it until you were sitting down to write uh in black and white well keeping a diary is uh, something which forces you to reflect on uh, whatever has happened to you um so that was certainly uh let's say a, a proto autobiography in a way um but during my career, I never had the idea that I would write an autobiography like this. This just happened uh, when I had finished uh, playing and uh, when I had the time. I mean, when, when you're a professional chess player, you're working on chess all the time. You, yeah, all right, you can write short articles, short pieces of analysis, but... Uh, a, a large project writing a book uh, there's very few chess players who find the time to do that um, so when I, I suddenly had all this time available after I quit chess uh, as I said I started to enjoy writing but and not as much reflection during your career yeah there was always reflection there was always reflection yeah oh okay yeah Okay. Yeah. And so Matthew Sadler uh, writes an absolutely glowing review. Again, rightfully so. I also love this book. And but from Matthew's perspective, I can see Matthew, of course, one of uh, one of England's top players, was a bright talent, and actually decided to pursue a career in IT. And you, you makes a brief appearance in your book. You guys played um, yeah. in his younger years, um, but. I sense from his review that it was like the road not traveled for him. So it was like an additional, I mean, um, he knows all the principles, but also it's like what could have been you guys, you know, both um, very accomplished players and he went down a different path. So I think for him, based on what he wrote, that that level, that added an, an additional level of sort of um, uh, identification with the book. But for me, as a 47-year-old, 2100 non-professional um, I still identify greatly with the book because to me, it was almost a story about aging generally. Like there's tons of chess and it's fun to play through the games and see how your, your game evolved and see all the great players that you played over the years. But this slow reckoning with losing your passion for something and with your skills gradually declining I think is something that's that's relatable even even beyond the chessboard. So I'm curious, Paul, if if you had these sort of big themes in mind when you were writing the book, or was it more just that's the chronicle and that's what played out in your life? Yes, uh, the latter. I think um, when I was writing the book, I probably was a bit surprised myself that. Uh, there was so much reflection on aging and um, declining in strength. And I must have realized at some point that this was actually the, the theme of the second part of the book or, or the last part of the book, that um, aging and declining is uh, a, a 
completely natural uh, human process, of course. But uh, for chess players, it makes uh, such a big difference whether you're young and growing or aging and declining in your uh, mental powers and physical powers. Um, so for me, it was probably also a discovery that this was actually a very natural human process, uh, one which every chess player, like every other human being, has to deal with. And um, it probably gave me a lot of satisfaction to uh, find that uh, I had dealt with it so well that I hadn't, uh, let's say, gone mad or became, become very depressed or um, dropped in an empty, in a black hole. I, I just, this is, of course, also where med meditation came in. Uh, I started doing meditation yeah. in 98 when I was 42 and I was already in, in a process of decline, though not very steep decline. I mean, I, I, I remained a fairly good player until the end. But meditation probably helped me enormously to um, just let it happen, this process of aging and declining. And um, sort of distancing myself from the chess player I, I used to be. Um, this is also... Um, like the 1993 peak in my performances, uh, this is also something which is very mysterious and which you can rationalize about, but it's it's really not quite possible to fully understand these things. But I'm quite sure that the meditation I did helped me to um, accept the way things were going and to just let it be, to uh, not try to be... Uh, cleverer than than life itself to just let it happen and that's, uh, that's yeah one I, one moment that yeah sorry, go, ahead. No, 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 go on sorry uh, i was i was just gonna say one moment that was illustrative for me was in, in 1998 when you were annotating your game with uh grandmaster mikhail krasenko um you you didn't fight as hard at the end, and you you write that at that moment, declining perseverance is becoming my Achilles was becoming my Achilles heel. Yeah. Um, and there's this famous story. Uh, I interviewed the, this author, Sasha Chapin, wrote a fun little uh, chess memoir from an amateur's perspective. Um, and he one of the principles in the character was was Ben Feingold. I'm gonna I'm gonna um, I'm going to spoil this for listeners who haven't heard my interview with Sasha or read the book, All the Moves That Matter. It's a fun book. But he teases at the beginning, like, there's a secret to chess that Ben Feingold told him. And obviously, he does, like, the big reveal at the end. So I'm going to reveal the secret for listeners who haven't read this year-old book. But Ben, in that in that book, says you have the secret is you have to play like you don't want the games to end. <laughs> um, which, when you wrote about how in in your game against Krasenkow, you just couldn't quite fight as hard as yeah. as you used to. Mm. Uh, I made that connection and can relate to it myself at some level. So you mentioned this idea of acceptance from your mindfulness practice. Was there any, was it a process for you to accept something like that? Like, were you mad at yourself or were were you deep enough into meditation where you accepted it all the way? No, it was definitely a process. Um, I think first you uh, discover that uh, powers like these are, are, are slowly declining, uh, the perseverance, so, which you are talking about now. And um, then gradually uh, the acceptance just happens. And uh, at some point you just know that you don't have the perseverance anymore that was natural to you when you were still 20. And yes, you accept and you know that you are losing things. You know that you are becoming weaker in, in, in many ways. And you also, what I find out is that you can still play at a decent level. Um, 
but you at the same time you know that this is only going one way and that is down <laughs> um so yes that's that's why even in, in the end i decided to to quit because i i i had lost uh the love of the game i think at at one moment it became too one dimensional for me and i just uh when i felt i couldn't enjoy playing chess anymore uh the, that was probably the the moment or the the limit i i knew that uh, my time was uh, up makes sense and and we have a question from uh, a listener of the podcast. This is um, from Brian Karen, who uh, founded the chess book, or sorry, the Facebook chess book collectors group. They have something like 40,000 plus members that I know there've been some some comments, people excited for your book, uh, for the translation of uh, Chess in Black and White, um, which uh, again, it's, it's available on Forward Chess now. Um, I think for the physical copy, it's probably going to be a slower rollout in the coming months from when this is heard. It's a, I should, I should mention it's a fantastic book, but it's very long. It, it can keep listeners busy for a long time. So yeah. um, if you, for me, I would recommend getting it in digital format just because there's tons and tons of games um, and because it's very long. But if you like a beautiful, thick book, uh, you, you can wait for that as well. Um, anyway, so Brian's question relates to this because you're talking about accepting decline and his relates to something that uh, us amateurs struggle with a lot, uh, which is um, why they either decline or might struggle to get better. So Brian asks, he says, broadly speaking, adult improvers face two hurdles. Number one, it could be intrinsic. As a person gets older, there's cognitive decline and other genetic age-related problems. Mm -hmm. Number two, external. Adults are busier than children and have less time for study, play. They face yeah. psychological burdens. Um, for example, if a child has a poor tournament, it's a learning experience. If an adult has one, he wonders if he's slipping so it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. So he'd like to hear your opinion, if you could describe what you feel is the more predominant problem and what, if anything, can be done to deal with these problems. Well, um, I think both... Um aspects that he mentions are um, very real um it's a very difficult question and uh, no one has uh, written a manual for that uh, i know of no books who uh, teach you to um keep your level or improve your level as an adult um i can only say th that uh the crucial element is do you still enjoy chess if you manage to um, play or do something with chess in a matter in, in, in a way which is still enjoyable to you then you are doing the right thing if it's a matter of um, trying to stop the decline just trying to stop it and nothing else then well, I would say this is in the long run pretty hopeless. Uh, but of course, I wish anyone good luck who, who tries to uh, avoid the unavoidable. Um, but if I look at myself, um, you know, I enjoy chess enormously now that I don't play it anymore. Now I am uh, back or back. I never was a real amateur. I'm just a real chess lover now. I enjoy uh, following uh, tournaments online, especially the elite tournaments, uh, Carlsen who is, uh, and all his um, rivals. When they are playing, I'm always trying to follow the games. And uh, writing about chess also gives me a lot of pleasure. So I, I really enjoy chess enormously. Now I don't play anymore. Uh, of course, the, I don't want to recommend everybody who uh, is trying to um, improve as an adult to uh, stop playing and um, just look at games, uh, follow games. But uh, this is what, what, what has worked for me uh, to um, release to the pressure that sh of, of having to perform and to just go back to that simple point where you once began the fascination for chess itself the love of the game 
uh, that has not declined at all um, in me. And I think uh, most people who have problems keeping their chest level uh, as an adult or even trying to improve it um, should probably not focus too much on the re- on getting uh, better results, but on on on. I think they should focus on how do I still enjoy? What do I still enjoy in chess? Is it the playing? Is it the uh, improving, improving my ELO rating? Or is it uh, the game itself, which I still enjoy? And if it's the latter, if it's the game itself, the game of chess, which you still enjoy, then maybe you should look for other ways to enjoy it and not non-competitive ways. wise advice unsurprisingly yeah I, I find it very relatable because personally i i go back and forth when i play competitively i wonder am i enjoying this i don't know, <laughs> you know some days i feel like i am some days i feel like i'm not yeah. um i do feel like in the final analysis it's good for me is what make is what keeps me coming back um i've mentioned i've mentioned this before but i you know i get distracted by my phone and um, I feel like I have a hard time, harder time focusing, both as the years go on and as technology progresses. And chess is the one thing that I, something that used to be a strength of mine, I'm still able to to bring back. So that's what keeps me going back to competing. Okay. But I'm curious, Paul, from your perspective, um, you you know you talk a lot about sort of acceptance and letting go and these uh you sort of um, mindfulness sort of um, themes that come across. Did you think about continuing to play and just trying to totally disassociate yourself from results? Or do you think as a professional with who's accomplished as much as you have that it's uniquely challenging? I tried to go back to chess in a small way. I went back to playing club matches for my uh, Amsterdam club. And this I did for uh, seven years. I, I just played these club matches, nothing else. Uh, and that... I did uh, to try and find out, do I still enjoy this? And then I had the same experience that you are describing just now. At uh, Some moments I enjoyed it, then I didn't enjoy it at all. Uh, but it was a nice experiment to <laughs> see if I still if I could still go back to being a, a player. This, of course, was not professional. This, I didn't earn any money with this at all. This was just amateur chess. But I did try to play at my best level. And, um, well, it was a nice experiment. But after seven years, which was, uh, well, it, it sounds in preface as if seven years, but this was probably just 50 games or so, um, I stopped again. Um, and uh, uh, at that point, I definitely knew that uh, th- this was now a thing of the past, uh, playing chess myself. I didn't, I didn't enjoy it anymore. But it was a nice experiment, and I, uh, I'm glad to have done it. By the way, uh, you said something just now which triggered me I'm not quite sure what it was, but uh, I'd like to add to our previous uh, topic that uh, playing chess or uh, watching chess, uh, so if you watch chess, you are still playing chess in your mind. So you're still using your brain cells actively. And I think whether you play or just watch chess, uh, this is a very good anti-aging method as well i mean yeah. it's, it's a slightly different subject from uh trying to be an adult improver but uh in general i think as long as you can enjoy chess and play mentally use these brain cells uh it's probably an excellent anti-aging program sorry for yeah, the diversion. I, I agree with that and that is no, no, that's that's one of the things that I always keep in the positive ledger and mm-hmm. that, uh, yeah. that, that keeps me going back for now, for now at least. Um, well, Paul, I want to switch gears and discuss mindful chess a bit. So mm-hmm. just to give listeners a bit of an overview, comparing mm-hmm. the, I mean, again, you've written obviously much more than these two books, but these two are newly available in the English language. So in black and white, 
um, sprawling, beautiful chess memoir. You could spend a year reading it and going through the games easily. Um, and mindful chess, uh, very maybe one or two diagrams, but not very much chess in it, although certainly plenty of mentions of chess. And you could read it in, in two days easily. It's uh, yeah. much sort of lighter um, book. And, and I'd like to dig into it, but I think to set the stage, um, maybe you should tell the story of, uh, first of all, we have a lot of American listeners, so they might be interested in hearing about your attending the New York Open in 1995 and picking up a book that set you on this this uh, whole path. Yes, well, um, actually, it wasn't the start of my interest in uh, meditation and philosophy, but um, it was a very uh, uh, important moment when I... Um, played the New York Open in 1995. Uh, as you probably know, this is a very tough tournament with uh, several games a day and uh, many strong players. And you have to play your very best to uh, keep the, the, the winning a prize uh, within your reach. It's, it's, it's very easy to uh, lose one game and then uh, you don't have any chance at all anymore. Uh, so I was completely focused during these uh, four days, I think, uh, on the chess and everything I could do to uh, keep myself as fit as possible. And uh, always between games, I just lay on my bed and emptied my mind completely. Uh, but uh, what I always did before that was uh, reading a few lines from the Bhagavad Gita, which was a book I had bought in New York, actually, just before the tournament started. I chose it because it was the smallest book available in the bookshop, um, but it turned out to be a fantastic choice. And just reading a few lines was always uh, enough for the chance to completely disappear from my mind, between games, I mean. And um, to be able me to 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 be able to uh, for me to, to make a fresh start for the next game, so it was quite a, a wonderful experience. Uh, also, um, very hard to explain. Sort of um, the, the the soothing effects this this book had on me, um, but definitely after that, um, I. I, I, I knew I had to pursue this to to this let's say this study of Eastern wisdom of uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, etc. And uh, a few years after that, I started to meditate. In fact, then then I uh, it it really became uh, let's say physical. Up to then, it had been an intellectual uh, study. But when I started to meditate, uh, it, it turned physical. It became uh, not just something my mind uh, was uh, occupied in, but uh, my whole body. Yeah, and you didn't just get casually into it, as, as no. you write in the book. No. You started going to these these meditation retreats, yeah. where you know you you would have very little sensory input for a week, 10 days. Yeah. And you, I've meditated here and there, but never at that level. And I was just curious because to me, there's there's something maximalist about it. There's, there's yeah. what do you think it was about your interest that said, I'm not going to do this for 20 minutes a day or an mm -hmm. hour a day. I'm going to go do this for a week straight. What, what led to that? Oh, maybe I'm a naturally uh, a perfectionist. That's one explanation. Mm -hmm. But I also think uh, I had, uh, intellectually, I had studied uh, these things so deeply that I understood that you have to go into this completely. And that if you don't, then it's simply not, it, it, it doesn't have the power that it is supposed to have. So it, 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 it just beca became clear to me that I had to go into this uh, all out. And then um, you soon enough, you feel that it is working on you, uh, for better or worse, uh, because you experience a lot of pain <laughs> in these retreats. Uh, it's not pleasant at all. Right. 
Um, but you do get the idea that you're on a, a, the right track in the sense that it, it's really going somewhere. Um, and that's, that is probably what, what kept me going, that I knew I, I got onto a, a path, you could say, um, th- which had a purpose. It wasn't just um, uh, a play. It, it, was, it was for real. It, it, re- it really was life-changing. That's, that's, that's what I felt, probably, that if you do this seriously, then it can change your life, and it did. Yeah, it's an interesting dichotomy, though, this idea that you wrote in the book, as as you just alluded to, you say, quote, the first meditation retreat was hell. Yeah. So it's not something where when you read it, you you say, oh, I'm going to go do this meditation <laughs> retreat. But then you also write about its life changing uh, positive impact. Um, mm-hmm. And of course, you write about this in the book, too. But um, what general advice might you give for a chess player? Uh, pros and cons of, of uh, taking up meditation. <laughs> Well, uh, there's a lot of uh, very different, very, there's so many, such a variety of meditation forms. Um, I think if a chess player wants to improve, he will naturally start thinking about uh, improving his um, mental health, his mental attitude, his um, mental toughness, and um if you're really serious about improving your mental health or state of mind, uh, then meditation is just a very uh, interesting tool um, to try. And I tried, and uh, this eventually led me to give up chess, but uh, that's probably because I was already Hmm. 45 years of age and it was a natural moment for me to quit chess. Um, I think younger players, would probably find uh, meditation very uh, restful for them. And in fact, um, some players, modern players, young modern players like uh, Gukesh from India, Prajnananda, and others from this uh, generation, uh, they come from a culture, India, where meditation is very natural and uh, completely accepted and not uh, regarded as something uh, bizarre. Um, And I think they already uh, practice uh, meditation. They have um, spoken about this in interviews. And um, for them, it's a very natural uh, tool to uh, keep yourself mentally fit and healthy, uh, even during the pressure of playing uh, high-level chess. So, uh, yes, I would recommend uh, people who, who, who are considering to start meditation, chess players who are considering starting meditation, to just try and give it a go to find a meditation center somewhere and uh, simply try. You will find out soon enough whether uh, it helps you or whether it um, destroys you as a chess player. Right. And and you write in Mindful Chess that mindfulness may or may not benefit your chess, but it will benefit you as a human. That's Um, that's, that's what I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, yeah. I agree with that. For I'm for saying words. it isn't helpful for your chess because mindfulness is not the same thing as concentration, and what you need as a chess player is uh, as deep a concentration as possible. Um, mindful chess is not really geared towards uh, deepening your concentration. It can be a side effect, but uh, it's not the purpose of the meditation. Um, but there are well, first, there are many other forms of meditation that are geared towards improving your concentration. And uh, second, uh, the much more important effect, I think, is what it has uh, on you as a human being. After all, even a chess player is a human being, and I think in the end, the human being always comes first. Yeah. Uh, again, well said. Uh, and we have one more question from a listener. Uh, this one is from David Ham. David, thank you for helping support Perpetual Chess via Patreon. And David asks, he says, 
I've recently been spending a more significant portion of my chess training time on the mental aspect of the game. I've identified several books in the general sports psychology space that I'm planning on working through. However, I haven't found a lot of resources directly focused on chess in that space. The only book I was able to find is Mental Toughness in Chess by Werner Schweitzer. I'm about halfway through that book, and it's okay. But given your focus in the area, do you have more or better resources that directly connect sports psychology concepts with the sport of chess? Well, this is a very good question, actually. And um, uh, it... it um no, there's, there's simply nothing good about that aspect of chess, I think. I, I know of no books which uh, could help you. I would suggest exactly what you have already been doing. Um, read uh, books which uh, deal with uh, sports uh, psychology in general. Um, it would be great if there were books on um, specifically on chess, but I don't know of any of them. Uh, the book that you mentioned, uh, I don't know. Um, I, I hope it will help you. But uh, yes, this is actually uh, an area in chess literature which uh, has yet to be uh, filled. Uh, I might write a book on it myself, actually, now that you mention it. Uh, we would love that. That would be great. I mean, I do feel like mindful chess uh, it touches on it in a sense, yeah. but yeah. but yeah. I do think it's uh it's it's fertile ground and and I noticed that you make references uh, to cycling a few times. Obviously, uh, very popular in the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, I'm, are there any books that stand out about cycling that that you found helpful or applicable to chess? Um. Not exactly to chess, but maybe to uh, the effect cycling can have on your mind. Uh, there's a very famous Dutch writer, Tim Krabi, who has um, written a book, The Cyclist. I'm pretty sure it uh, has been translated into English and many other languages because it, it, it's really a phenomenal book. And he is also a chess player. I think it's called The Rider in English. Ah, okay, yes. Yeah, I interviewed him. He's a fan, oh, yeah, fantastic writer. But I think it's called The Rider. I think it's called the writer in English. Yeah, yes. he's. I mean, he's a living treasure. He's. Um, yeah, he, he's yeah. fantastic, and he also Definitely. used to be a very good chess player. So he does actually uh, yeah. compare cycling to chess at at at, at some point in his book, and um, he. I think. Actually, this book stimulated me to take up uh, cycling myself. When I uh, had read this book, I uh, bought a racing bike and uh, started uh, doing uh, rides in the country. Uh, did this for several years, which um, helped me also to keep my physical condition uh, at a reasonable level. But uh, yes, you have to look at uh, other forms of uh, literature to help you in this respect. Um, yes, my mindful chess, perhaps. Uh, also, uh, other books which touch more about the psychology of chess. Uh, there's also uh, this fantastic book by Gena Suzonko, The Essential Suzonko, where he writes about the human beings behind the chess players, the famous Russian chess players that he has known. I think this also might help you a little bit in understanding the chess psychology and the, the human side of being a chess player. But uh, yes, you have to look at the fringes of chess literature. There is simply no uh, good, no standard manual, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, the the essential Sasanko is a wonderful book, and yeah. of course Sasanko, one of the many players who makes many appearances uh, uh, over the board against mm -hmm. you in yeah. in black and white, which mm -hmm. which brings me to to the next topic. I mean, I just you've you've played so many legends, so I just love to hear a few memories about some of the players who make brief appearances in your book. For example, you played uh, you played the Polgar sisters, and mm -hmm. I believe it was uh, Vikanze. Um, in in the the B section, um, yeah. in their teenage years, uh, what are your memories of uh, those young Polgars? 
Well, uh, first of all, um, amazement uh, at their uh, being so special. Um, the first to emerge was the oldest, of course, Susa. I met her first for the first time, I think, in London in 1981. She must have been 12 or perhaps 11 then. And uh, she was uh, not participating in, to- in this tournament where I played, but uh, she was playing Blitz with an American grandmaster, actually, John Fedorovich, a uh, contemporary of mine uh, who was a very good player. And uh, she was just uh, crushing him. Uh, so this was uh, my first um, experience of what the polka uh, of polka strength. Then uh, one or two years afterwards, a, a good friend of mine uh, paid a visit to Budapest to the Pogas, and he came back with stories about there being two younger sisters who were even better than Susa, and I just didn't believe him. I thought he was pulling my leg. And uh, when I first met Sophia and, um, and Judith, uh, especially Judith, of course, turned out to be um, even better than Susa indeed. And she was just a phenomenon in those first years. Um, yes, this tournament that you mentioned in Wijk aan Zee in 1990, I think, um, and all three pl- uh, sisters played in the B section which was a grandmaster tournament, but um, not as quite as strong as the A section. Um, and they did extremely well. And I, I lost to both Judith and Sophia. I was very lucky to get a draw against uh, Sousa. Uh, but I wasn't the person who did worst against them. Luke van Wedy, for instance, uh, who was young at the time, but already a very good player, uh, he lost to all three of the sisters. And after that, uh, yes, of course, they never looked back. Um, it's, it's, been a, it's been a wonderful period in the history of chess, actually, when they played, when they were all active and all having their own successes. Um, it, it, it was quite a, a unique period of of in the chess history. I'm, I'm really quite glad to have uh, lived through this period, this period, although it cost me a lot of games. I think uh, I lost to <laughs> you three times, uh, to Sophia once, I think. Uh, only against Sousa, I could sort of um, keep the balance. Uh, maybe I beat her once and a couple of draws. But um, yes, they were really pretty special. And they still are, but of course they're yeah. not like players anymore. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll read a quote from from your notes to the game, your first encounter against Judith. You write, so she she wins this technical end game and mm-hmm. Right. You write, in hindsight, but only in hindsight, I look with great admiration at the flawless accuracy, effectivity, and directness you had demonstrated in this game, which reminds me of Fisher's play. Yeah. She didn't seem to think it was anything special, which made it even worse for me. Yes. But at the time, it was a horrible experience to be swept off the board by a 13-year-old girl, it even was. though I knew very well that I wasn't the only one. Yeah. yeah. It um, was. Yeah. And I think it's hard... And I think for younger listeners, like prodigies, in a sense, are a dime a dozen now. You know, they're they're amazing still and they're getting better every year, yeah. but they're coming so fast and furious that I think it's hard to understand how far ahead the Polgars were of of other of their younger contemporaries. Yes, I think they were probably the first. Didn't... Yeah. So now it is. N- yeah. Not, and for not... them to. Sorry. Please go. On. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and the fact that they were girls, like yeah. shifting the paradigm in that sense yeah. as well, makes yeah. it even even more incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a shock. Um, it was a real shock for everybody who at that time was an established, uh, strong player. We all had to uh, deal with uh, it. And um, I think I was um, not the only one at all who just, couldn't cope with this uh, sensational change of everything that you had been used to. Uh, exactly as you say, they being girls, not boys, uh, made it even uh, more difficult, much more difficult to uh, adjust 
to having them as an opponent. Uh, it was a great time. It was a really great time. Yeah. And, and then, then, of course, again, you played so many. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to mention uh, one other uh, great player that I played quite uh, quite often against. Uh, Victor go ahead. Uh, let's see if it's the same one I was going to ask you about. Got you yeah, go ahead. I think you read my mind. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I have others too, but that was the next yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I played um, eight games or so against Kochnoi. Um, we never drew. I won three, he won five. Uh, the last game I played against him was in uh, Antwerp, Belgium in um, uh, 1997. Uh, when Kochnoi was already uh, 61 years of age, um, far older than any other elite grandmaster already at the time. And um, at that time, uh, the score between us was 4-3 uh, in his favor. And I was, I was completely set on equalizing the score in that uh, game. I thought, okay, today I'm going to win. And then our score will probably uh, remain at four all forever. But although I got a very good, even winning position, uh, at in the at at one point he was down on time to his last second, uh, last minute. But he exuded this will to not lose to win, to beat me, uh, which actually felt like hatred. It was a very strong emotion <laughs> which he managed to convey to me, uh, a, an emotion that he was not going to let this game go. And I was <laughs> sort of beaten by it. I, I don't know what happened. Uh, I, su I suppose we need neuroscientists to explain this, but this emotion which I felt coming across the board towards me, it was just too strong for me, and I collapsed and lost that game too. Yeah. So that was very interesting. It taught me that uh, even at this age, 61, now I'm actually older than 61 right now, but I still uh, remember... I, it's still, at 61, you're not supposed to be that good anymore. Um, it, it, it shows you that you can maintain a very, very high level, uh, but at a cost, I think. As a human being, uh, I think you, uh, Kochnoi suffered from um, still being such an ambitious player who... I, th I think it, he remained an exceptional chess player, but as a human being, I suppose he suffered for it. Anyway, he was one of the most colorful players I ever played against, and it was always a joy to, uh, to meet him. Yeah, and getting back to that idea of playing like you don't want the game to end. <laughs> it sounds like when you last played him in 97, even at age 61, he yeah. had that mindset in spades. And yeah. that was the period where you were already starting to grapple with uh, yes. uh, waning Definitely. tenacity. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it, it, it seemed like he... Uh, I'm more yeah. on your side, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but by the way, this was quite exceptional. I think I've never felt this emotion uh, from any other player. Kochnoi I've heard Kasparov described that way. You didn't you didn't play Kasparov, right? No, I never played Kasparov, unfortunately. No. Okay. But I, I yeah, suppose, he's the one where I've heard about this. Yeah, I suppose uh, he might have um, this uh, will to win, or at least not to lose, but practically a will to win. Uh, perhaps in the same respect as Kochnoi. But then uh, Kasparov stopped at a very uh, uh, relatively young age, a bit my age, I think. What was he? Uh, he must have been also yeah. like 40-something. Uh, so he never went all the way. I think a few way. years younger, yeah. Yeah, he never went all the way like Viktor Kochnoi did. So to still have this power at the age of 61, 
uh, I think that is uh, absolutely unique to uh, Victor Kochnoy. Yeah, young, younger than 45, to clarify, not younger than 40. And uh, did you do any postmortems with uh, Victor? Oh, yes, yes. Yes, not always, but uh, quite often. And uh, he always enjoyed uh, postmortems very much and um, was very creative in finding um, alternatives, uh, better solutions, um, suggestions. He, I think he, in a way, he enjoyed uh, postmortems enormously. Could go on forever indefinitely he uh, i think he uh, he very often uh, just kept analyzing with me and with with other players uh, until they uh, shut down the building or something and he threw him out he uh, couldn't stop he was a great he was a great one for uh, postmortems and um, other moments of uh, analyzing the game I had a very uh, creative mind, you know, very creative. Was never never happy until he had really exhausted a position. Yeah, again, speaks speaks to uh, why he had such longevity. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you also write about your many encounters with a uh, fellow Dutch legend Jan Timon, and you write that he had. Like he was a he was a stronger player than you, mm -hmm. but he had a an even better score than he should have based on rating. Yeah. Why yeah. do you think that was? I think it was. I think because he was my first idol as a young player. Um, he is about five years older than me. Uh, so when I started playing uh, chess, when I started. Uh, getting to know the chess world a little bit uh he was already an established uh young star um so i think he he became my idol from a very young age and i was never able to shake off that mentality of playing against your idol um so we never played on an equal footing mentally I was always looking up to him, even when we, for a short period of time, had about the same rating and uh, weren't so very different in uh, in playing level. But um, I, I could never shake that off. No. Not until after I stopped playing chess. So I, I just mentioned that uh, in uh, 2010, I started playing club matches again. And... In these club matches, I played two games against Jan Timman as well. And then I was completely free. I just, I had finally oh. lost that uh, idle, admiring mentality. And then I could just play against him all out with no mental barriers. That's fascinating psychologically. Yes, it is. Yes. It's amazing. It, it amazed myself at the time that I was sitting opposite. There I was sitting opposite my old nemesis, Jan Timan, and uh, I didn't feel any negativity at all. I just enjoyed those two games. I lost one and I won one, but it was completely uh, on equal terms, like it had never been before. Mm. Yeah. And another player you mentioned who's already come up, uh, you know, equally renowned as a writer these days, Jenna Sasanko. But I was really struck by you mentioned the depth of his opening preparation and especially mm -hmm. I, I believe it was the Catalan, the, the toughness of uh, cracking his Catalan. Like, yeah. what was it like to play him so many times and feel like you have to <laughs> get out of the opening OK in those battles? Yes, yes, yes. It was uh, it was very daunting prospect to play against him but uh very different from playing Jan Timman um it was just that he was so strong uh, when i was young he was uh already a world class player and he was just such a strong opening expert uh but also a strong player generally uh, so I think he was one of those people who really forced me to become better myself. 
I played them so often that um, every time when I was young, I felt that I simply had to play better than I could, if that is a possibility. Um, he forced me, he was one of those, maybe he was the player uh, who I should credit most with uh, forcing me to become a better player myself. And he was such a power at the chess board. And what did you do? Like, how did that manifest? What did you do to, to get better? I think uh, what I did was take these games against him uh, as seriously as I could and sort of uh, do everything a little bit better than I, 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 I thought I could do them. By the way, um, he was also uh, a player who I uh, observed becoming weaker at a certain age. Again, I kept playing professionally until he was about 50, I think, maybe a little bit longer than that. And in his last years as a professional chess player, I could just feel his decline. He was just becoming weaker and weaker. I mean, he never dropped, of course, uh, to a, a really weak level. He still remained a grandmaster. But uh, yes, I could feel that, that he uh, he was uh, probably, yeah, he has meant a lot to me. Actually, now that we are talking about him, perhaps I realized this for the first time, that he really meant a lot to me and uh, that he was also the first player who I noticed the inevitability of decline in a chess player. I just observed it in him first. And a few years after that, I started observing the same symptoms in myself. <laughs> I recognized the symptoms because I had already observed them in Sezonko. Yeah. Uh, did you ever discuss it with him? No, I've never discussed these things with anybody. I could write about them, but uh, I never discussed these things. Um, and even after I published my book, uh, Zwaardopit in uh, Dutch in 2010, uh, none of my old colleagues uh, came up to me and uh, discussed what I had written about. And they, uh, that's, chess players just don't do that. They talk about uh, huh. what's wrong with uh, the Grunfeld, but not about uh, what's wrong with uh, themselves. Right. And you told a funny story about Sasanko, the, the 1988 Olympiad involving a, a draw offer to the to the Soviet team. Yeah. Could, could we hear that story? Well, in 1988, the Dutch played a very good Olympiad. Um, after, uh, I think, five or six rounds, we were paired with uh, what was still the Soviet Union at the time. Um, of course, the top favorite for winning the um, Olympiad. Um, Gena played a fairly short draw that day against Artur Yusupov and then started uh, watching the other games. And at some point, he decided that, well, we're not doing that badly, actually. Uh, maybe we should propose uh, a draw, 2-2, two, two, four draws, which was at that time was quite common to... Uh, to do in, in, in team events. It, it wasn't considered uh, unsporting or anything. Um, so he approached our own captain and said, well, what do you think, uh, captain, about offering a 2-2? And the captain said, well, yes, but this is a Soviet Union we're dealing with. So surely they're not going to accept. And so again, uh, well, you never know. And he just went to the Soviet captain, which I think was Makari Chef, also a famous grandmaster, well-known grandmaster, um, and proposed it to him. And Makari Chef uh, was clearly uh, surprised, um, felt that this was perhaps a little too big a decision to make by himself. Uh, so he uh, said, okay, Reasonable, but I have to consult Kasparov on this. Kasparov was not playing that day. Karpov was board one. Um, and then Kasparov was uh, 
consulted. He looked at the boards, uh, the games, and his judgment was extremely negative for uh, his his own uh, fellow team members. Uh, he looked at uh, Karpov first, Karpov versus Van der Wiel. Karpov, bad position, bad. Then uh, <laughs> went over to, I think, uh, Ivanchuk. Uh, remember, this is still the Soviet Union, so not just Russian players, but uh, from all over um, that uh, country. Uh, Ivanchuk versus uh, Rini Kaif, I think, had just sacrificed a piece. Um, looks very, very, very suspect. Uh, the last game was, I think, Piquet against... Um, I'm not quite sure. You should, no, no. Well, I'm not quite sure whom Piquet was playing against. Um, a similar comment, and he said, "Yes, okay, two, two. And uh, Makarichev, who had to make the official uh, decision, uh, was still hesitant. Clearly, this had never happened to him before. And then um, Sosanko decided to stop the clocks himself. And then um, <laughs> there was no going back for uh, Makarichev and. Um, the arbiters who had been completely mm, kept outside all these negotiations uh, simply stopped the other clocks and uh, the match was over. But um, this was just so unusual and uh, unique it, it, I, that, uh, yes, it is, uh, it is a real story. Uh, it is a real uh, story <laughs> within the greater story of that Olympiad. Uh, it was uh, something that uh, never happened again, I think, that a player stops the <laughs> clocks and this is accepted by all and uh, it's the end of the game. Yeah. Did anyone even look at him funny or it just, uh, he just got away with it? <laughs> I think the Dutch players were all a bit surprised, but they were all very happy to accept. Uh, the Soviet players, uh, I think, they all had the attitude of uh, hierarchy. Uh, they just looked at the, at their captain and said, well, this is for you to decide. Doesn't matter to me, or it's not my decision, it's your decision. And uh, that's what happened. So they all accepted. Um, I think after the, afterwards, Ivanchuk uh, protested that he wasn't actually losing, as Kasparov thought. He was actually, uh, his opponent <laughs> just had just made a mistake and he was probably winning. Um, but that was a feeble protest because it didn't count for anything against uh, what Kasparov and Makarichev had already decided. Yeah, and Ivanchuk, you must have been. He was pretty young, right? Yeah, it was 88, so he was probably uh, 18 or 19, yes. Yeah. So I mean, you played no... him when he was pretty young too, right? Uh, yeah. Right, no authority. <laughs> I played him only once, I think. This was in 94 in Munich. Yeah, a draw. And... And you also played uh, Mikhail Tal just once, is that right? Also just once, yes, uh, towards the end of his career, of his life, actually. Uh, also in the Weikansee tournament in um, 1988, yes, I think 1988, yes, yes. Yeah, my memory is beginning to uh, fade a little bit. There was a time when I was absolutely uh, flawless about dates and uh, years and uh, names, but uh, now I have become a little bit hesitant. Um, so you sorry, at least uh, had to think about it. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> that's that's okay. You're doing yeah. you're doing uh, quite all right. Mm -hmm. um, any other famous? I mean, favorite, excuse me, stories from uh, from all of your years competing with these giants? Well, uh, a lot of things happened, of course. But um, I think in hindsight, uh, what happened to me when I played Viktor Kochnoi in Weikensee in 1978 was probably my favorite story. Um, it was a game where I got into such a deep concentration uh, that I completely dropped my normal level, playing level, and uh, managed to um, play the whole game uh, at a much higher level than I 
had ever been able to do before that and um, kept my concentration uh, not only during the the session but in those days we still adjourned games so we played five hours 40 moves five hours then adjourned uh, had a break of a two hour break and then continued the game so i had to keep my concentration in total for uh, at least uh, nine hours probably more and uh, this I did. It was never broken, not for a single moment. And that has been such a strange experience that um, I still look back on it as the most uh, remarkable uh, moment of my entire chess life, that I was able to keep that incredible, incredibly deep concentration for such a long time. So it's, yeah, it's not, you describe it in the book. It almost comes across as like yeah. an out of body experience. Yeah, it it almost was. Yes, yeah, I think it it was very close to that. Yes, and, and you never had that feeling in another game. No, never. Sometimes you got close to it, perhaps, um, but uh, that was a truly unique experience. So this is not like an anecdote. It's just like a, a very impressive moment in my life. It's a, a moment when uh, chess somehow took control of me instead of me trying to take control of chess. Yeah, I can only uh, talk about it in uh, spiritual or mystic terms that there's there's no uh, rational uh, explanation uh, that i know of that this could happen to me at the time that's uh the beauty of life the one of the mysteries of life uh, that, that it, someone yes. can have an experience like that yes that the thing um, like that can happen to you and yeah and this has been amazing conversation as i expected based on your book uh, Paul, and the last major topic I wanted to touch on is is your work at the Max Owe Center uh, there in the Netherlands. I haven't been to the Netherlands since the mid 2000s, mm. um, but I remember being struck by the chess culture there, and particularly being struck by the big chess set right in Max Owe Square. And that the, I didn't, fortunately didn't visit the chess center nearby. But for some some listeners will have been there, some wouldn't. But could you describe your work at the chess center? Well, I'm uh, the chairman, and uh, we work with uh, volunteers almost entirely. And uh, what we do is um, keep a chess center uh, alive, which offers people the chance to uh, visit our museum. The Max Oewe Museum uh, celebrates the life of uh, Max Oewe, the the only Dutch player who managed to become world champion. This is in uh, the 1930s. So we have a very nice museum, which is uh, very popular with tourists, actually. And uh, we also have a chess center with a library and other study facilities, and you can play there. And we organize uh, small events uh, now and again. Uh, it's uh, probably uh, the only, uh, let's say, chess center uh, in the Netherlands, and there are not too many uh, places like that uh, anywhere, I think. Uh, we uh, survive uh, almost solely on donations, so it's, uh, in fact, it's quite incredible that we are, exist at all. Um, but uh, we do exist already for uh, 35 years now. And uh, we have recently moved to another location in the same building, which has cost us a lot of money. And so we set up a crowdfunding, which again showed how um, many people support uh, chess and the Max Evers Center in particular uh, in the uh, Netherlands and even abroad, because we have um, already um, acquired uh, about 15,000 euros um, from that chess world. So we are really um, sort of rooted in, in, in chess uh, culture in, in Holland. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've interviewed so many. I mean, the, 
the Dutch legacy in chess is is immense. And uh, obviously, I've interviewed so many Dutch players, and honestly, it's it's a little surprising. There's only been one world champion because there's so many uh, yeah. incredible players, and so many Dutch players have contributed so much to the game. Mm. Well, um, after all, I will definitely be contributing. Thank Sorry, you. Go ahead. Well, uh, yes, we've but had only one world champion, but uh, we have come close with Jan Timan, who has been the world number two for quite a few yes. years, actually, before um, Kasparov took control of the chess world. And recently, of course, we have also Anish Giri, who is also very, very close to uh, the level of Carlsen, and he has been very close to um, securing a match for the world championship. So, yeah, I think for a small country, we, we're doing okay. It's uh, we're, we're, yeah to have more than we have already have would perhaps be a little bit uh, arrogant. Yeah, and especially during the Soviet era, it was mm. basically it was almost impossible for a non-Soviet. I mean, yeah. obviously Fisher and Ure pulled it off, but yeah. but yeah. it was very difficult for anyone from outside of uh, the Soviet Union to win. Yeah, um, yeah, and I was obviously like like. All Dutch chess fans uh, saddened that uh, Anish didn't make it into this candidates because uh, yes, could have been could have been his year. It um, would have been wonderful. Would have yes. been, yeah, yeah, would have been fun. It would have been wonderful. And, and uh, yeah, and how do you assess the Dutch chess scene now here in the U.S.? There's the professional element, but there's also just chess seems more popular than ever here yeah. in the United States. I'm curious in the Netherlands, I, I, I sort of have a feeling what you'll say about the professional level, but I'm also curious at an amateur level what you see in terms of chess's popularity. Yeah, I think it's uh, very similar to the U.S. actually. Uh, chess has uh, profited, uh, benefited enormously from uh, the rise of online chess. In Holland, online chess has also become uh, all the rage. In fact, uh, chess is enormously popular with uh, children of uh, primary school age. And um, youth clubs uh, are simply overflowing with um, uh, kids who want to become more involved with chess. It's it's very, very popular at the moment. We are really experiencing uh, a, a huge wave of uh, popularity. Uh, unfortunately, this is not yet reflected in more sponsorship, in more uh, tournaments. Um, so I'm not quite sure where this uh, popularity is going. But uh, yes, we do uh, see an, a, a, an immense rise in, in, in chess, uh, in, in interest in chess. Also, uh, uh, thanks to uh, Beth Harmon, I think, and uh, the Queen's Gambit, uh, they have also yeah. done very, very much for chess in, in Holland as well. Good to hear. Yeah, it's definitely the same here in, in the yeah. U.S., Mm -hmm. um, well, I encourage listeners to support the Max Oway Center if they are able to. I will. I will make a donation when I uh, when we say goodbye, which I think um, will will be shortly. Um, and unless you have, uh, do you have any other major topics you'd like to discuss, Paul? Well, I think we've uh, covered a wide field, haven't we? No, we I have. I mean, just... there's so much in your book. There's. Mm. Well, I would just uh, like ahead. to say hello to uh, everybody in America, in the, in the U.S., who loves chess. And um, I would certainly uh, advise everybody to keep on loving chess and to uh, just be involved with chess in a way that makes you happy with it. So for me personally, this has become uh, being a spectator rather than a player myself. And uh, of course, if you're younger, then uh, I would simply love to see all of you uh, become good players, better players. Great advice. Yeah. And uh, excellent advice. Yeah. It's, um, that's a lot of what this podcast is about is kind of we know we love chess. 
but where does it fit within our lives? And and that's that's in a sense what your book is about too. The the evolving I'm referring to in black and white and mindful chess for that matter, but sort of how chess as a companion, one's relationship to it, uh, just as any relationship can evolve over life. Um, and the idea of acceptance that that that's not a bad thing. That's that's just the, the cycles of uh, of life as, as it comes. Um, so the book is called Chess and is called in black and white. Uh, couldn't recommend it more highly. And uh, Mindful Chess as well is a very fun read, especially if you're interested in sort of philosophy and Zen Zen ideas and c- considering mindfulness. I highly recommend both books and uh, I'll, I'll link to, to where to get them. Oh, it, I know we were saying goodbye, but we actually didn't discuss fundamental chess openings, Paul. Oh, okay. could, we, could, we yeah. do, could we discuss that for a few more minutes? Yeah, um, sure. Yeah. So, because yeah. because as I was starting to tell you before we recorded, it's mm-hmm. it's a rare, you know. I grew up with these chess encyclopedias, mm-hmm. but they were just moves for the most part. But yours is this rare book yeah. that you could tell, uh, you know, a fourteen hundred player or someone, um, you know, firmly amateur level that you want to know what the opening moves are, but you need to understand ideas too. And this was kind of the only book that really explained the ideas of every opening. So you were saying that even, even today, this book still sells pretty well. Yes, it's, it does. And um, uh, thank you for your kind words. I agree that uh, at the time of writing, uh, this was a fairly unique book in that uh, I just explain um, opening theory uh, starting from move one and not going too deeply, not becoming really uh, involved with fashionable variations or with um, subtleties. I just want to uh, explain how uh, opening theory as a whole is a body which um, simply starts on at the start of the game and that you don't have to be frightened of it. So... Also, it's encyclopedic, so I'm uh, trying to uh, simply present all the accepted possibilities starting from move one. And um, yes, at the time of writing, this uh, was a completely new concept. I think there, since then there have been a few books more or less similar. Um, but uh, yes, it's been a, a tremendous success. I'm I'm I'm. Uh, I'm completely surprised by it myself but the book is still selling well even though it's by now um, about 20 years old it simply doesn't age very much because i do not go into the subtleties of uh, what uh, current theory um, is exploring i I simply present the openings and uh, explain the reasons why they exist yeah, it's and it's only 10 bucks on Kindle. And yeah, it's just a, a really useful book to have around because if you come across some new opening and you're a little unclear on like what the driving principles are, as mm-hmm. you say, it's not so much about the, the theory. You can just look and you have very lucid explanations. Any chance of an update of that book, Paul? Um, yeah, I think I proposed the idea about 10 years ago to my Dutch publisher and they didn't want to do it. But maybe by now, Hmm. it uh, should be done uh, at least in the English language. Yes, yeah, it's 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 a very good suggestion. I'm I'm not uh, I haven't been uh, thinking about that uh, for uh, some time. But um, yes, I think an update in the English language would be very good. Yeah. Okay, so we'll leave you, Paul, with two books to write. You've got to update FCO, yeah. and yeah. you've got to write a book about sports psychology and chess. But so, so we've got some homework for you. But I would love, love to uh, discuss those things uh, and to chat again sometime. But I want to thank you for your time, Paul, and for your wonderful books. Thank you, Ben, for talking to me, and uh, good luck with your uh, perpetual chess podcast, which is a great idea. <laughs> <laughs>